All right, good morning again. Uh, welcome to another edition of Hunger Games Corona Edition. I have with me my hand sanitizer, more hand sanitizer, more hand sanitizer, and of course, the star of the show toilet paper. All right, what are we talking about today? We are going to be talking about city life in the antebellum north. But before I do that, I want to show you what Blackboard looks like right now. All right, I'm just going to take one of our U.S. History 1 classes here and let this load. All right, a couple things I want to show you. Uh, first of all, underneath syllabus, you'll notice this link to virtual office hours. And what that will do, it will open up this program called Discord, or it will open in a web browser. And then you can see that we can talk to each other, we can chat with each other, and there are specific text channels for World History 1, World History 2, US History 1. There's also a voice channel, so we can talk to each other if you want to. So this is how I'm doing virtual office hours. Also, you'll notice the course calendar has been updated some. So everything here, all these due dates should be correct now. When I click on lessons, all of the reflection paper drop boxes are taken care of. Museum review drop box has changed a little bit. You'll notice now there is an approved virtual museum list and you can look at all of these museums here. There's also an approved historical films list uh, if you want to do your museum review on a film instead of a virtual museum. These links just go to the trailer so you can watch a little bit about the movie before you choose to buy it or spend two hours plus of your time going over it. I think these are very good movies. It's a good mix of lists, especially if you are a Mel Gibson fan. There are three Mel Gibson movies on here. Uh, the, all of these museums are very good as well. Uh, a couple of them you may have to translate from either Spanish or German into English, but if you use Google Chrome, it will do that for you. All right, now on to the star of the show. City life in the antebellum north. Now, first thing, if you've never heard of the word antebellum, that simply means before the war. And the war we're talking about is the Civil War. Now, here's what you need to know. The 40 years before the Civil War is the most rapid urbanization in American history. What we mean by that is more people move the, from the countryside to the city than ever before. I know 2,500 people doesn't sound very big, but you got to put yourself into an 1820s mindset where there weren't very many people living in the United States. In 1820, there were only 56 towns in the entire country that had more than 2,500 residents. By 1850, that number has jumped to 350. New York, just like today, it was the largest city back then. And Brooklyn joins New York City about the same time, and then there gets to be over a million people in New York City before the Civil War. Now, if you move into the city, you have about a 50% chance of moving out of the city every 10 years. So you don't just move into the city and stay there. Usually you move there for a couple of years, then you move out, and then you may move back in. So there's like a 50% turnover in people every single decade. It is a lot. Life, uh, you may have recognized parts of life back before the Civil War. Uh, you wouldn't have technology or anything like that, of course. Uh, you wouldn't have been very happy, but you could have lived. Uh, first thing you have to know, housing is really, really crowded. We don't have any high rises. We don't have any apartment buildings. Uh, you pretty much lived in these two, maybe a three story building, and they were very, very crowded. Uh, places like New York City, you rented out pretty much any room you had. It could be a closet, bathroom, bedroom, whatever. Uh, there were multiple people living per unit. No public water, no public sewer, only private companies. And guess what happens? If you don't pay your water bill, no water. If you don't pay your sewer bill, no sewer. 
and a lot of people would they would have to go to like a public water source maybe there's a well or a spring in the middle of town and for sewer you might just dump it into the road no public police no public fire those are also private companies usually it started with night watchmen or nightly patrols you would pay somebody to come and patrol your house and that could have its own set of problems because if you don't pay your bill those same people might come into your house fire protection usually bucket squads or a volunteer fire department or there are private companies you had to pay now just think about that if you don't pay your fire bill and your house burns up they just let it burn there are also many different types of entertainment uh, theater and notice that's spelled with an R E instead of an E R that means we're talking like Shakespeare plays Broadway or their equivalent of Broadway we don't have people going to movie theaters or anything like that we're watching Shakespeare sports what sort of sports are they doing well horse racing was very popular so was boxing running and baseball was the newest thing and everybody loved baseball urban clubs we're talking like adult fraternities uh, some examples today you might find are like the moose club or the elks or the shriners something like that well back then they would have freemasons they have sporting clubs like boxing clubs or horse racing clubs something like that social clubs where everybody gets together and they have social dances social gatherings all that stuff we're not supposed to do right now if you were a lower class person there were some theaters you could go to but very often your entertainment's going to be in the street some sort of street gatherings uh, maybe parties in the street or maybe street performers something like that and then one of the places where all different classes would meet political rallies now we don't really think of political rallies today as being the cool thing to do but before the civil war everybody went to political rallies changes in living patterns well for the first time more people live apart from their work than they live with it if you think back to that change from the moral economy to the market economy I know that was a long time ago hopefully you got the notes for it uh, people used to live in the place they worked and now they're working away from home they're working in factories things like that you also have the wealthy elite they don't want to live in the cities anymore so they're moving further away from the city centers they're moving out of downtowns uh, they want to get away from the populations they want to get away from the pollution they want to get away from the poor people they want to get away from the smell of the city the danger of the city they, they don't like immigrants they don't might they don't like migrants they don't like lower classes and some of these lower class people see are seen as pollution in itself now there's mass production mass production leads to labor costs going down lower prices new products the rich get very rich a great example of this is New York City in 1845 the top five percent of the wealth holders owned more than 80 percent of everything and then last but not least you also have the invention of the telegraph and this is going to become very important because news is able to spread much quicker than it could before the telegraph is going to allow for mail ordering and it's going to change the way that Americans live even the countryside has some change the agricultural sector of the country becomes more industrialized there's a guy named Cyrus McCormick you may have never heard of him before but he invents something called the mechanical reaper in 1834 this makes it much quicker and easier to harvest grains such as wheat or corn instead of having to go out and cut everything down by hand there's now a machine that will cut it down and collect it for you then you have John Deere most people think John Deere invented the tractor I'm sad to inform you he did not I probably ruined your childhood but it, you'll be okay uh, what John Deere actually invents is the steel tipped plow and he does that in 1837 and the reason that's so important is if you've never been to the Midwest uh, the soil in the Midwest it's black it's great to grow stuff in but there's a thick crust on top of it 
uh, wooden plows just couldn't get in deep enough to turn the soil over and get to the good stuff. So for the early 1800s, nobody really lived in the Midwest because they didn't think it was good to live there. John Deere proves that wrong when he creates a steel tip plow and then it opens up the Midwest for farming. We also get chemical fertilizers inventions and usage which allows for more food to be grown and more efficient food to be grown. And then last but not least, you've got the railroads. The railroads are going to spread throughout the Midwest, which means all these new farmers can still sell their goods at market in the big cities. Places like Chicago and Milwaukee become very important cities, and they're still very important cities today. So this is going to be a really big period of change right before the Civil War. Uh, this is just a little bit of the physical layout, what the cities were like. On Thursday, I'm going to talk more about some of the reform movements that happened and some of the religious movements that are happening in the North before the war is over. All right, that is it for today. I have promised a secret word, and today I think I will make that secret word hand sanitizer. All right, we will talk to you later. Have a good day and stay safe.